So hi everyone. Thanks so much for joining me today for the University of Waterloo School of Architecture Virtual Symposium Series. My name is Vic. I'm an architecture grad student. So this is the first in a series of four events that will be taking place throughout the school term. Uh, seems like we have pretty good participation. I'm so happy to see so many familiar faces. And before we start, just to start, just a couple of housekeeping things. First, we're muting and hiding the videos of all the audience members to prevent distractions and interruptions. So if you have questions, please raise your hand in the Zoom participants tab, but note that there's gonna be a chance to talk at the round table. Secondly, the talk is being recorded. You can tell that in the corner of the screen. And after the recording will be made available along with the transcript. Also, you'll notice in the chat that I've posted some booklets for you guys to download. So because the symposium is taking place in the midst of a number of world changing events, I want to start off with a couple of acknowledgements. I'll start with the more familiar but still underused land acknowledgement. While a typical land acknowledgement recognizes the traditional territories on which the School of Architecture is situated, today as we connect across Turtle Island in this virtual space, we're reminded of the widespread and deep-rooted colonization that has affected all of us. We recognize that this history of stolen lands extends far beyond our Cambridge campus. While as designers we dream of playing a role in creating a better future, we must recognize architecture's historic and current role in colonization, a history which has uprooted indigenous peoples from their territories and imposed a force of assimilation. This land acknowledgement recognizes the important relationship between land and community and serves as a small step in a larger architectural commitment to continue to repair settler relationships with First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples through community building. While I personally speak to you from the Southern borderline of Treaty 6 territory, I acknowledge that the Waterloo campus is situated on the Haldeman track. Six miles on either side of the Grand River, this piece of land was promised to the Haudenosaunee of the Six Nations of the Grand River in 1784. What was once 950,000 acres is today only 48,000 acres. The school, our home, sits on the unceded territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee's people. While listening to these talks, I encourage you to think about the role intentional communities can and must play in repairing settler indigenous relationships. Secondly, in the wake of the recent police killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Regis Korchinski Paquette, and many others who are victims of a long history of systemic racism, I want to recognize the pain and outright outrage being felt in our student body. We can't ignore that our conversation today is situated within these front of mind realities and struggles. As architects and designers, we have a responsibility to move towards a more just, equitable, and inclusive society by calling into question the current spatial practices, many of which are designed to exclude Black, Indigenous, elderly, disabled, and queer folks, we can begin, begin to create more resilient and safe spaces. As we listen to these talks, I ask us to think critically about the ways co-housing can address these issues, as well as the ways it often fails to do so. And finally, I just wanna take a moment to recognize that we're in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. Many of us are sheltering in place, trying to work, study and survive in less than ideal circumstances. I would be amiss not to acknowledge the widespread social, economic and mental health impacts this is having on our student body, their friends and family and the broader global community. The University of Waterloo School of Architecture Virtual Symposium Series has come about in response to this pandemic in an effort to bring our community together to discuss the role design can play in creating more resilient communities. So as we're all living the effects of COVID-19, we're increasingly faced with the stark inequity within our communities. As the lack of affordable housing, healthcare, and food security is exposed, we're turning to each other for guidance, asking ourselves, what changes as designers, what changes as designers and architects can we make to this broken system? Today, we're being asked to think about the ways architects can contribute to this under-realized housing model. Centered on community building, co-housing challenges are existing notions of property, ownership, collaboration, and affordability. The dream of building communities that have integrated support networks, which are economically, socially, and ecologically sustainable are realized in models such as co-housing. Designing for collaborative living forces us to consider how we design collective spaces, what we can learn from non-hierarchical structures of living, how participa participatory design and community engagement are integral to the design process, and how these ideas of community-centered living can begin to restructure systems to be more resilient in times of crisis such as these. Today, we're joined by four speakers, 
John McMinn, Grace Kim, Crystal Bird Farmer, and Adrian Blackwell, who I'll introduce throughout the symposium. Each speaker will deliver a talk on co-housing, and at the end, we'll have a round table with a series of questions and reflections. Throughout these talks, I encourage you to compose your thoughts and write your questions into the chat box when the round table and discussion starts. We welcome reflections or questions on the intersections of co-housing with COVID-19, anti-racism efforts, and Indigenous reconciliation during our roundtable. I hope that you're listening comfortably, and if you're Zoomed out, like I said, there'll be a recording and transcript available for you to access after the event. So I'm going to start us off for our first speaker. Um, John, if you want to get ready, I'm going to introduce you and then you can share your screen. Sure. So John McMahon is a professor of architecture at the University of Waterloo School of Architecture and is a graduate of the Architectural Association and McGill University. He has taught and lectured at a variety of schools of architecture in North America, Europe, Asia, and Australia. He's a principal and founder of the Toronto-based architectural practice MJ Architecture, whose portfolio includes building and public space design, exhibitions, and art installations. He has published widely in journals on contemporary Canadian architecture and has written books on the cultural dimensions of contemporary sustainable architecture. 41 Degrees to 66 Degrees, Regional Responses to Sustainable Architecture in Canada, co-authored with Marco Polo, and on Canada's leading engineering practice, Yoli's, A Canadian Engineering Legacy, co-authored with Beth Capuzza. He was also the recipient of the Canadian Council Prix de Rome in Architecture and the exhibition 41 Degrees to 66 Degrees, Region, Culture, Tectonics, represented Canada at the Venice Biennale for Architecture in 2008. I've asked John here primarily due to his collaborative approach to design. In addition to teaching a host of design electives, John also runs a design build workshop that works in tandem with the Waterloo Architecture Local Indigenous Community. His compassionate and empathetic approach to learning is why I thought he would make a valuable speaker, as well as his experience working on co-housing projects. Okay, John, I'll pass it off to you. Thanks, Vic. Um... Hello, everybody. It's great to be here and to participate in this. I guess the first of these uh, symposiums, uh, symposia that's happening this summer, and I think it's a wonderful initiative. And uh, so, thanks first to Vic for all your work in, <coughs> excuse me, in organizing this. Uh, it's really great to see the uh, the ingenuity and the initiative that uh, you know individually we can all bring to these challenging circumstances that we are finding uh, right now uh, in terms of the various issues that Vic has just mentioned with the pandemic, with the systemic uh, issues of, of uh, kind of culture wars, racism, et cetera, uh, marginalization. And uh, so I think that the idea of talking about co-housing and the idea of talking about participatory design is something that is a real, it's a, it's a privilege in relation to these things. Um, one of the challenges I find in thinking about these things, the questions of colonization in relation to indigenous versus settler populations in Canada, for example, is what do we do about this? What do we, how do we engage? Um, and it's not an easy thing to do. Uh, and it's certainly behind some of the things that I do in terms of teaching with the design build program and the collaboration with First Nations communities. Um, and it's something that is really underlying uh, a lot of what uh, we do in our practice. Um, and so the co-housing piece is something that is important in that regard um, because it really it relates to uh, community engagement and, and community responsive ways of thinking about housing. So I'm going to share my screen. Uh, let's see. Okay, so is that, uh, that showing up, community responsive housing? Vic, is that, is that showing? Yeah, yeah, okay. That looks great. Okay, so, um, so what I wanted to do was to just uh, go briefly over, and I'm gonna go through these things fairly quickly. I'm gonna try and keep it to about 20 minutes. Um, and uh, if I start to run over, uh, Vic, maybe you can give me a signal, uh, but I'll try and be brief about it. Mm -hmm. um, and let's see here, I gotta figure out the way to advance, which I'm not able to do, wait a minute. Okay, here we go. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two, um, two projects um, that we've, uh, we're involved in, uh, with, our, with our practice in Toronto. Um, one is um, in uh, Victoria, <clears throat> and it's, a, it's a, a co-housing development in a rural environment. And the other one is uh, in Owen Sound in Ontario, and it is an adaptive reuse, reuse project um, in a core area of the downtown uh, and uh, utilizes uh, a, a series of existing buildings. Um, 
in a neighborhood that is a kind of transitional neighborhood. So it's a neighborhood that is, um, uh, has, where there's a number of uh, kind of economically marginalized uh, kind of sector of the population, I guess you could say. And, um, and this is a, 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 a site that uh, is a contested site. Uh, clearly it's, it's, the, it's the old courthouse, uh, but also the jail of Owen Sound. And no, those, those functions no longer exist in the buildings on this site. And so the idea of, of, of readapting and reimagining um, what the site could be and how it could start to become uh, a community hub in a different way um, than has been the case in the past is something that was of interest to us. Um, just going to having some trouble advancing here. So oh, here we go. Okay. So start off with, I just wanted to say a little bit about co-housing in terms of, of my experience with it. Um, so uh, you see on the screen here images uh, from the, the uh, top right and, and left uh, and the bottom left are uh, images uh, related to uh, Harborside Co-Housing, which is a, a project in, in Souk, which is on uh, the southern tip of Vancouver Island near Victoria, a smaller community, uh, kind of outlying community. Um, and this is a, this is a, I guess probably the, the, the process by which this came to be was a conventional process in co-housing, which is that a group of people got together and uh, over a period of about three years, as I understand it, um, developed uh, some some parameters and guidelines for what they wanted to um, see in terms of uh, co-housing development, what the, the characteristics that they wanted to embody, the values that they wanted to, uh, to, to use in terms of the, the kind of guidance principles for the project. Um, they eventually came up with a site, uh, they hired consultants um, and eventually designed uh, and occupied the, the, the site. Um, and so that is a that's a model for co-housing that is that is fairly typical, um, and uh, it really is a participatory design model. There's another model which um, is also um, uh, sort of an active one, which is uh, represented by the um, co-housing development proposal that you see on the bottom right in the screen there in Vancouver, and that is where. Um, one, a consultant, such as the kinds of consultants who are involved in the design of a co-housing project in the conventional sense that I mentioned with Harborside, um, uh, get involved early on and sometimes um, with uh, a pre-existing co-housing group or sometimes um, uh, as a way of, of developing a project with an interest in co-housing, first acquiring the land or first and developing the parameters for it um, and, and then um, finding a pre-existing pre -existing, co-housing group, of which there are many across the country, and um, starting to work with them. So, so in a sense, it's a, it's a way, it's a, some call it co-housing light or a fast tracking of co-housing. And the, that latter is, uh, is what is represented in terms of the projects that I'm going to show today that we've done, we've been involved in, with in our office. And that is um, uh, knowing that there are uh, sets of um, co-housing groups that are that are pre-existing uh, also then looking at conditions in an existing community um, responding to conditions of the uh, things like the official community plan uh, some communities have a sustainability report uh, have set of guidelines uh, that are about uh, housing in the community um, uh, and and so the idea is the kind of the blending of of a kind of a larger community aspirations with the co-housing group that comes in and finds whether they uh, see the aspirations that are uh, outlined in a preliminary way in the uh, proposal that's done by the consultant um, whether those match with their own and usually then there's a kind of process of of discussion uh, adaptation of the goals of the co-housing group uh, in relation to the pre-existent uh, goals that are set up, um, usually in response to uh, questions that are established by a larger community. Um, and so that, as I say, that model is what we're going to be discussing, I'm going to be looking at today with these two projects. Um, just want to say also that, you know, I, I um, and this this engagement with co-housing in my practice has been something that's been ongoing for in an active way with the particularly these two projects over the past five or six years but as a student um, in the uk in the in the 80s i was very aware of co-housing and uh, at that time it was much more prevalent in europe than it is in north america it's becoming more common in north america uh, but the images you see here of this co-housing development in denmark were fairly typical uh, of of aspects of co-housing that i had some that i visited 
and that I studied while I was an architecture student, and that is um, engagement with uh, with landscape, indoor and outdoor uh, reciprocity. Uh, lots of things to do with kind of uh, gardening and um, and outdoor spaces that really uh, find ways to blend with the ex with the interior, uh, and then communal gathering areas. You see um, in this. I hope you can see my cursor uh, in this. The kind of collective spaces. Um, of of a of a development so that individuals have sm often small um, uh, private units, but uh, some degree of what their uh, their living space is actually utilized through collective spaces, and. Um, and that model um, is is prevalent in a variety of places in this in Scandinavia in Germany, etc. As we got involved in it, we started to think about uh, this um, idea of co-housing for a number of reasons. So the situation, uh, if you, I hope you can see my cursor, um, is uh, here on uh, southern Vancouver Island. So here's Victoria, um, the Senate's Peninsula, and an area here called the District of Highlands, which is actually where I grew up. And there was uh, a, a conservation initiative that was uh, underway when we got involved, um, which was to do with the last of a number of lakes that were privately held in the community. Uh, and they are distinct ecosystems. Uh, and then um, there was uh, a need uh, for um, assisting that process of acquiring that land and that's where we came in in terms of of um, uh, acquiring the the land that uh, is shown in red here um, for um, the uh, where, where the housing development was to be proposed um, and uh, I'm just going to see if I can get rid of there okay uh, I had uh, some images of Im people over top of my screen there so I can see this better so uh, just to give you a brief idea so the the notion was um, uh, develop uh, uh, this piece of land 27, 27 acre parcel of land uh, part of it would be gifted um, so the portion here kind of l-shaped portion would be gifted to the larger property which is essentially here part of this what's called the Mary Lake uh, Nature Sanctuary uh, and the idea was to, to build a housing development that was very much in keeping with the um, the sort of um, understanding of the land, understanding of the ecosystems, um, but also uh, related actually to um, an engagement with um, uh, First Nations communities uh, on Southern Vancouver Island. So there's the Senate's Leadership Council and there's specifically the local band, which is the Sartlip for, uh, First Nation. Um, and part of the acquiring of the land eventually for the Mary Lake Nature Sanctuary had to do with an engagement with the Sartlip band and the idea that there would eventually be the potential for building a longhouse, uh, a ceremonial longhouse. And so the idea um, of um, this here, it says here, the location of uh, possible community amenity. So the idea of, of that longhouse being able to be built uh, on the site on part of the land that would be donated to the nature sanctuary was a, a piece of this. Um, so there's a couple of images here. You can just get a sense of the beautiful landscape of this kind of West Coast uh, rainforest um, that is prevalent in Southern Vancouver Island. Lots of wonderful nature. Uh, beautiful little, little fragile lake, uh, very, very uh, delicate ecosystem. And so the necessity of, of uh, preserving that as a kind of nature sanctuary was also important. It had been a private property and the previous owner who uh, um, just the, it was bought from the estate of this previous owner had built a variety of beautiful trails throughout the property, um, very carefully conceived in relation to the topography and so on. And so there was a, a lot of a, a base on the property that was really quite beautiful. Um, the project, uh, the, as we developed it, uh, involved a variety of, of buildings. So the total number of units was 32 units. Uh, it comprised of three eight-unit um, multi-unit buildings uh, that had um, anywhere from or one, one and two bedroom units from 700 to 1,000 square feet. And in, in addition to that, there were a series of duplex or semi-detached houses. And the idea was uh, following the guidelines from the official community plan. There were a couple of parameters that were important in that. One was the idea that people could age in place in this community. Uh, this is a rural community just outside of Victoria where there are no multi-unit residential uh, accommodation at all in the community. And so the idea that um, when people age out of their, um, you know, three to five acre lots with their large house and want to stay in the community, there's no opportunity for that. So the idea of providing some kind of housing in a co-housing co development that would enable people to stay in the community 
keep with their roots in the community on the one hand, and on the other hand, to provide some affordable house, housing and potentially rental housing uh, for younger members of the community and families. And so the idea was that the sort of the aging in place retirement portion would be related to the kind of multi-unit um, buildings and the younger family uh, accommodation would be um, targeted towards the, uh, or the, the duplex or semi-detached housing would be targeted towards younger families. Um, there's a whole array of environmental um, uh, attributes that was part of the design. So solar arrays, um, ground source heat pump, uh, locally harvest wood for uh, gas, wood gasification boiler. Uh, we looked at the idea of microhydro in a creek that runs through the property. Um, uh, water collection on a cistern on a high point of the land. Uh, so a whole set of, of um, and, and of course the buildings being a passive house um, character and quality. Um, so that, that's the, those are some of the general principles. And here's a couple of renderings of the distribution of, of the uh, buildings, the kind of duplex or semi-detached um, houses here and three eight unit buildings that had within them um, some individual units. And then as well as that, some um, collective um, uh, collective facilities. And here you get a sense of the plan. So this on the left is the, uh, are the semi-detached house types. So they're two-story houses um, with uh, kind of collective spaces, uh, den that could be converted to a bedroom, um, laundry, bathroom facilities, and then, and then bedrooms on the upper floors. Uh, the uh, the multi-unit uh, portion uh, would have units um, of varying sizes uh, on two floors, uh, both of which, uh, so um, the upper floor, they were built on slopes, so the upper floor would act be accessed from the rear of the unit, uh, whereas the lower floor would be accessed from the front of the unit. So the idea of, of creating relationships to the, to the surrounding landscape um, being important and the idea of distribution of the buildings throughout the or, or with within the larger area of the land so that one would have a sense of being in a in a dwelling place that was very connected and without without views of other buildings um, and so they were situated using the topography using the the tree cover to the existing tree canopy etc uh, to create a very uh, intimate relationship with the natural surrounding uh, let's see so uh, I think that's it for this one. Just, just, just a brief overview of that. The other project I wanted to talk about was uh, uh, one that uh, we're, was just in the very early stages in, in Owen Sound. Um, uh, Owen Sound, so uh, for those who aren't familiar with it, Owen Sound is um, at the base of the Bruce Peninsula in Gray County in Ontario. Um, one of a number of communities along uh, the Georgian Bay shore, which have tremendous uh, attributes in terms of natural environment, uh, uh, hiking, uh, you know, use of the waterways, um, etc. Uh, and so Collingwood is probably the most uh, well-known one with the ski hills, uh, but there's also uh, a variety of other ones. Um, Meaford is somewhere along the shore here, and Owen Sound is one that's, that is, um, has been has an industrial base. Uh, there was a significant uh, industrial and manufacturing and shipping base in Owen Sound, as there was in Collingwood, uh, but that's all largely disappeared. And so Owen Sound is a is a community in transition. Um, and the opportunity to uh, get involved with this uh, seemed really interesting as a real counterpoint to the kind of very rural nature of the Earsman Creek co-housing development in Victoria. This is a very uh, very urban site right in the heart of uh, right in the heart of the city. Uh, so literally two minutes walk from the kind of commercial core of the city, which is which is right in here. Um, and you know uh, this this image here of the of the former um, kind of a shipway is basically right in here. So Owen Sound is, uh, is uh, you can see on the map here, is a kind of uh, cleft in the, in the larger shoreline. Uh, so it gives very protected, protected waterways, great for fishing and, and recreational boating. And was, uh, there was shipbuilding, there was uh, grain elevators, et cetera, which you can see here. And so there's a kind of remnants of this industrial history, but um, much of that is disused. Um, in addition to that, then there is, of course, um, other public buildings, uh, such as in this case on this site. It's a, it's a, I think it's a one and a half hectare site. Um, the courthouse building that was built in the first, first built in the 1850s and added onto, uh, later added to it was the um, uh, a jail building. So you can see here um, uh, jail yards, and I'll show an uh, aerial image of that in a minute. Um, the uh, the the uh, governor's house. Um, so a residential component for the um, for the guy who ran the prison. You 
brick and stone buildings uh, right in the heart of the build, right in the heart of the city. Uh, right across the street is uh, a variety of, of um, houses, some single family dwellings and some uh, kind of row, row house buildings. Uh, so decent housing stock and, and um, relatively low density. Um, but uh, uh, an area that's very interesting in terms of it being, as I say, a transitional neighborhood um, that uh, has, has, like many Ontario towns, suffered through the loss of manufacturing, loss of employment, um, and is now, in a sense, reviving through um, it's in part becoming a kind of retirement community. And so the, the, the targeting that what, what we are thinking about in terms of this, and as I say, it's very early days, um, is that this would be a coast housing development that would be primarily uh, thought of in terms of, uh, again, the idea of aging in place or people retiring to a place like this where there's tremendous amenities uh, in the vicinity um, in terms of uh, outdoor recreation and so on, but also the idea that this would uh, augment uh, the situation in the downtown core um, to bring increased density, uh, bring uh, a variety of amenities. Um, this aerial shot from Google, you can see, so the site, the, the lawn that you saw in the, one of the images there was this. Um, the three prison yards are here, one, two, and three. And then the uh, the governor's house and the courthouse building, and then a variety of buildings, kind of at the back of the courthouse and into the prison yards, which are which were the former jail buildings. Um, interestingly, there's a, a courtyard here, which you can see in in here. And so the idea of this building is to provide, or this complex, is to provide housing, but also to um, partner with. Um, various organizations. So there is a, a group called, you know, there's a, a, a museum gallery or gallery, I guess called, called the Tom Thompson Gallery. Um, uh, and it has, if it has, there are some, there's some collection of, uh, of Tom Thompson and uh, perhaps group of seven uh, paintings that they hold, but also they have a contemporary arts uh, program, very active contemporary arts program. So it's the key uh, contemporary arts gallery. And so they have uh, artists in residence programs, uh, uh, Etc. in that gallery. And they have a small, very small space um, in a nearby area of the downtown core. They've been interested in, in this site actually since, it's, uh, since it became available, but the, the sc scope and scale of the site was too large for them. So uh, our, our, what we're working on is, is a partnership arrangement with that, with that gallery uh, institution, as well as to think about um, a, um, some kind of commercial space, a restaurant of some restaurant cafe that kind of thing um, and the idea being that then those would occupy the ground floor of the old courthouse building the second floor of the courthouse would be smaller uh, individual units um, there would then be a variety of new units built a uh, combination of, of townhouse and perhaps uh, uh, probably only up to three stories for much of it, perhaps uh, an area along the north side that would be a four story where there would be a smaller multi-unit um, style of development. And the idea would be that the, um, the, the courts of the, or the, the, the prison yards would be actually kept and, and incorporated, which may sound strange to people, but I'm gonna uh, show you something in a minute that gives a sense of why um, the thought is that this might be something um, uh, interesting, worthwhile. There's a character to this. It's part of the history of the city. Um, and um, and while it has a very, the idea that the, the legacy of incarceration is something that is a very kind of uh, heavy, um, has a heavy character to it, uh, the possibility of reimagining the fabric of a historic buildings in a city uh, and even something as, as you know, perhaps controversial or, or um, challenging as, as something like the question of incarceration, um, Re reimagined in terms of something else is something that um, we find interesting as a as a as a thought. So um, the notion, as I say, of the of the public face of, of the public functions, of the building being there, the potential of a kind of sculpture court here, and then kind of courtyards um, where the, all of this would be opened up. So there would be a kind of a labyrinth of spaces um, throughout the site that would be utilized as part of the realm of the project. Um, so. There's, uh, in terms of that, there's not no more drawings because uh, it's at the very, very, very preliminary stages. But I want to just briefly talk about um, a, a reference that um, 
uh, I visited and is uh, I've, I've found to be a really exciting one. And that is the Taekwun Center for Heritage and Arts, Arts in, in Hong Kong. So it was the former police headquarters of Hong Kong. And there is uh, this shot here is a former prison yard. Um, there was a new arts uh, building done by Herzog and de Moron. I mean, they did the, they did the design of the entire uh, precinct. Um, and so it's a combination. There are a combination of this was the drill yard for the, for the uh, kind of um, uh, police officers and so on, which has been turned into a sculpture court of which you see a detail here. Uh, there are a variety of different arts functions uh, and cultural functions as well as the heritage preservation aspect of it and it's a really remarkable uh, project in terms of the adaptive reuse of the fabric of something um, and gave me sort of uh, hope in terms of thinking about the possibility that one could reimagine uh, something in a in a um, in a in a city um, that has a, a heavy and and perhaps dark legacy uh, such as incarceration of people to something that is um, uh, altogether different. So that's one kind of reference. Um, the other one is just thinking about kind of courtyards and thinking about arts and so on. And so uh, images such as this is from the National Gallery in, in Berlin. This is Paley Park in New York. Uh, another, I, I forget where this is, but a, but a courtyard in, uh, um, it's Holland or France, I can't remember. Um, and then just the idea of, of courtyard spaces with uh, lots of foliage. And so the, in a sense, what I'm talking about here is the reimagining of something in terms of those, those yards as something altogether different, the bringing new life and a, and a different perspective in terms of both housing on the one hand and public use on the other hand, um, and the and the saving of heritage buildings um, uh, with the kind of the within the context of the history of a of a town or of a city. Um, so that uh, I think is my last slide. Uh, oh, I just wanted to briefly talk about, yeah, the sort of typology issues. And so Marmalade Lane in Cambridge uh, by Mole Architects in Cambridge, England. Um, and just flipping ahead. So, uh, you know, this is this is a kind of typical muse laneway um, condition uh, that one finds in Britain and combine that with a kind of large courtyard space, which is, um, you know, uh, for gardening, gardening, allotment garden, uh, kind of uh, activities, and so the the sort of notion of the garden on the one hand, and the and the kind of muse laneway on the other hand, and then ideas of collective space uh, in the in the common house that is typical. So that's this this area here is the common house, uh, and so this combination, uh, which I find interesting in this project, um, and and uh, I think that uh, we're looking to try and find some of those characteristics about typologies of urban urban building, and then the idea of of uh, public green space and a variety of different spatial conditions um, being the kind of thing that we're interested in in the Owen Sound project and in, in another way in a rural environment in the in the project in Victoria and I believe that is it okay so okay thanks John that was great that sharing screen sure. uh, very timely um, I'm so excited to see some of the work in progress, and I think that's going to segue nicely into Grace's presentation.